But the biggest secret of these early Dark Ages lies with the people who didn't destroy a city and who weren't nomadic warriors, a people who conquered and then settled. They lived just like the Romans and left behind a glorious legacy, one which remained deliberately hidden for nearly 1,500 years. This is Ravenna in northern Italy. Today it's a quiet, picturesque city celebrated for its Byzantine legacy, the art and architecture created by the Eastern Roman Empire. Or was it? In fact, much of the glory of Ravenna is not Roman at all, but barbarian. Just as the Vandals had crossed over the Rhine, so another group, the Goths, had been pushed into the empire by the Huns. Here in Ravenna, the Goths took over the last capital of the Western Roman Empire. For 33 years under their king, Theodoric, it was the equal of any Roman capital. Theodoric renovated and reformed its institutions, improved and enhanced its splendor, and in a few short years created one of the wonders of the age. This would have been like walking through heaven's gates. If this had been an age of darkness, then here, without doubt, was a cathedral of light. This is Santa Polinare Nuovo, built by Theodoric nearly 1500 years ago, one of the brightest jewels of the Dark Ages. I'd like you to look at the uh, mosaics from this position. You can see that the background is shining, is reflecting the light from the windows because it was made of uh, glass cubes and gold uh, cubes. And the robes of the saints are dull, are opaque, because they were made using marble cubes, so as to give the impression of wool of textiles. These works were commissioned by Theodoric, the Gothic king. Yet most visitors today think they are Roman or Byzantine mosaics. Why should that be? Is it because we have all been conditioned to assume that work of this quality must be Roman? Perhaps there are other reasons. As I looked more closely, I began to wonder, why are there so many mosaic curtains in a scene of such splendor? And what do these hands, unattached to any bodies, signify? Could I learn the answers to these barbarian riddles in modern Ravenna? Mosaics are still being produced here in exactly the same way as they were in the Dark Ages. Only highly skilled workers could produce glass and marble with the desired effects of scattering or absorbing light. To a barbarian immigrant, the effect of turning tiny pieces like this into works of art must have seemed magical. Can I cut one? Can I cut you? Me, me. Yes, if you want. <laughs> okay. Just a little. Okay. Perfect. Can you use this or not? Yes, it's a, yes, it's I a good use. shape. Oh, yes. uh, goes here. Uh, <laughs> no, here. No? It's better. Here. Oh, there. No, okay. Okay. These pieces, called tesserae, are cut and placed on a pattern, a pattern which sometimes reveals itself only at a distance. Gold mosaic was made by placing gold leaf between layers of clear glass. It's a slow, costly and very secretive art, and it was only commissioned by the rich and powerful. Later rulers were no exception. Here's a copy of the famous portrait of Justinian, 
the Roman Byzantine emperor who ruled Ravenna after Theodoric. In Santa Polinare, I wanted to see whether the mystery of the curtains was any clearer. I realize now that they reflect so much work that they must have had a very deliberate purpose. What were they supposed to represent? This part of the mosaic that shows you the royal palace, all this mosaic was made and commissioned by Theodoric. This mosaic has been changed, altered. We could say that it has been vandalized by uh, the Byzantines because some images have been destroyed. Those images that had portrayed Theodoric, members of his court, members of his uh, clergy, and that stood between the columns, now they have been replaced with curtains. But you can still see the hands uh, here. There is one hand here another one here, another one here, and another hand here, and another hand here. And you can still see the halos here of the heads that have disappeared. All these elements uh, tell us that previous images have been destroyed. It was an act of censorship, we could say. Those who succeeded Theodoric deliberately left some traces of his presence the hands on the pillars, to emphasize their own ability to destroy his barbarian kingdom. The returning empire was determined to banish the image of Theodoric from history altogether. But one rare image of him survives. This is a medallion that was um, uh, issued in the, five, in the year 500, and it's the only uh, image that we have of Theodoric and maybe you can see a certain similarity with uh, the mosaic. There certainly is a similarity between Theodoric's face on the rare medallion and the image of Justinian I'd been working on. The medallion shows Theodoric without a crown and simply dressed. And recent research has proved that the crown and the brooch on Emperor Justinian's mosaic were added later as was the name Justinian itself. Could it be that the mosaic face had once belonged to Theodoric? What would happen if you compared the images closely? So they really airbrushed him out? Yes, they airbrushed him out. The returning Romans had felt so threatened by this evidence of a barbarian culture that they removed it. But they weren't able to disguise Theodoric's tomb, a confident statement of his barbarian origins. This is one of the most important buildings we have in Ravenna. This is the mausoleum of Theodoric. There are echoes of his early childhood on the plains of Eastern Europe. And to many, the shape of the roof resembles a yurt, a tent favored by nomads from the East. We know also that Theodoric come from uh, a people, nomad people, but uh, he lived in a palace during uh, when we, we was in Ravenna, not in a, in a, in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> well, most people would choose to live in a palace, yes, I think, yes, yeah. yes. even a nomad. So how did they build the mausoleum? Because some of this stoneworking seems very good to me. Yes, it's very good, uh, and they have no mortar for this building. The vast dome of a roof was carved from a single piece of stone which was shipped across the Adriatic Sea from Istria in modern-day Croatia. Sauro found it on my map straight away. This is the area where the stone come from for the mausoleum. Ah, Istria, Istria, Croatia. Okay. This is Cyprus. Cyprus. Yes. Cyprus. And this is the Holy Land. 
This is uh, oh, this river Ganges. Ganges, yes. Yes. At the end of the world. Yeah. The, where, <laughs> where is the end of the world here? Under Theodoric, the Goths established a kingdom that foreshadowed the shape of modern Italy. A first step towards the creation of modern Europe, perhaps. But what matters to me is not so much the extent of his power, but what he believed in. I'm travelling north now, to one of the most dramatic examples of Theodoric's spiritual vision. The 5th century was a time of religious ferment, and Theodoric was an Arian Christian, not a Roman Catholic. Arians, like Theodoric, didn't believe in the Holy Trinity, could not accept the divinity of Christ. For the Catholic Church, this was heresy. This track in southern Austria once led to a walled city perched high in the mountains and long since vanished. It's a place where he protected both branches of Christianity and let them worship side by side. Side by side on the top of the mountain stand the ruins of two ancient churches. The Catholic Church on one side, and here, some 50 yards away, the Arian Church. As the two congregations worshipped, they must have heard each other's prayers. This just and civilized barbarian said once, we cannot command the religion of our subjects, since no one can be forced to believe against their will. Here, as in Ravenna, the Goths displayed an extraordinary tolerance, a tolerance perhaps we wouldn't expect to find among barbarians, and a tolerance perhaps that we're lacking today. People still come here on pilgrimage, and though they are not honouring Theodoric's memory, it seems to me, of all the barbarians, he's the one we should remember. The barbarians have been dismissed as the Hell's Angels of history. For 1,500 years, we've had a one-sided view of them. I've discovered there is no one label that can be applied to the various tribes who took Europe from the Romans. The Vandals, who breached the frontiers at Mainz, simply valued different things and a different way of life. The Huns formed a military force which was able to rival and overpower the Romans, helped by a technology which was to change warfare for a thousand years. More than that, they were a sophisticated and cultured people. The enlightened Gothic kingdom of Theodoric showed itself at least the equal of Rome, and in many ways its superior, especially in tolerance. This barbarian world so threatened the Romans that their historians and propagandists tried to erase it from history.